So this is the first video in a short series introducing some of the major ideas of the Protestant Reformation. And in this video, we just want to lay the groundwork. What was it like to live in Europe before the Protestant Reformation? That is before 1517, when Martin Luther, a German monk and professor of theology, nailed his 95 theses to the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. And we'll get back to that. I was driving around my neighborhood about a week ago, and I took photographs of some of the churches that were there. And within oh, only 15 or 20 minutes, I had photographed the signs in front of six different kinds of churches. And this is a really good place to start because it's at the time of the Reformation that we get this explosion of different kinds of Christianity. So tell us what you took pictures of. I took pictures of a Lutheran church, of a Baptist church, of a United Methodist church. There was a Catholic church there. There was a Congregationalist church. There was a Presbyterian church. And so five of those six churches were created as a result of the Protestant Reformation. So let's go back to a time when there was only one kind of Christianity. Christianity in Western Europe. And that's the religion we today call Roman Catholicism. Now, we didn't need to use that phrase, Roman Catholicism, because there was nothing to differentiate it from. The term Catholic really means universal, and so that makes the point that this was the universal church. Or that was their ambition, to be the universal church. And we use the term Roman Catholic because the head of the church is in Rome, and that's the Pope. And that man was enormously important because he would lead the way to salvation, to heaven, according to the Catholic tradition. That is, one found one's way to salvation, which was tremendously important because the alternative was hell. And it's important to remember, I think, that back then the concern for most people was salvation, was how to get to heaven, and the path was one path. It was through the teachings of the church, through the sacraments. In a way, it was a simpler time to live because you had one choice. You didn't have to say, well, what religion should I be? Except for those very few people in Europe, for instance, very few Jews and even fewer Muslims. So the church really infused everybody's life. It, it was the vehicle to salvation. And just for the average person in a small town, the church's spire would tower over the other buildings. The bells in the tower would ring on the hour. The church would celebrate the saints' feast days, what we call holidays, that is, holy days. And it was, in a sense, the church that marked the days of your life and the major events in your life as well. And through the sacraments, you help to earn God's grace. You help to secure yourself a place in heaven. And those sacraments included baptism, confirmation, communion, which you might know as the Eucharist, penance, also known as confession, marriage, last rites, and ordination for priests. And so it's just a good reminder of how important the church was in the lives of everyday people. And those everyday people, although they might look to their local priests, would look to the Pope in Rome as the ultimate authority on earth. And the Pope at this point in 1517 was Pope Leo X. So Pope Leo X was intent on rebuilding the Church of St. Peter's. And the plans for St. Peter's were very ambitious. In fact, Pope Julius II, who committed commissioned the rebuilding of St. Peter's, the Pope before Leo X, said he wanted to create the most grandiose church in all of Christendom. And they did. The church itself, St. Peter's Basilica, was tremendously important to the authority of the Pope. By tradition, St. Peter is buried under that church, and St. Peter was charged by Christ himself to lead the church, and so St. Peter is understood to be the first Pope, and so every succeeding Pope is taking on the job of St. Peter from Christ himself. And so the very authority of this office is vested in this building. The problem is the building was really expensive to construct. And the question was, where were they going to get the money? Well, there was a pretty common way to get money, and that was selling indulgences. Now, an indulgence was a piece of paper that made it possible for you to get to heaven more quickly. Most people, when they died, you had throughout your life confessed your sins, you had atoned for your sins, but there would probably be something that you hadn't quite atoned for. And so for most people, you wouldn't go straight to heaven, you would go instead to this place in between a 
kind of way station before you got to heaven, a place called purgatory. And it was indulgences that brought you time off from purgatory. So this is a little tricky because indulgences were actually a very old tradition where if you did a good work, you could in fact receive an indulgence. That is a kind of certificate that would speed your soul out of purgatory to heaven. Even in certain extraordinary cases, it might allow you to circumvent purgatory entirely and go directly to heaven. The problems began not so much in the actual indulgences, but in the perception of the selling of indulgences. And here's what happened. Leo X granted indulgences to his representatives to raise money for the building of St. Peter's. But this was misunderstood to mean that one could simply pay money and then gain access to heaven directly. But keep in mind that money was for the rebuilding of St. Peter's. And so you were doing a good work. And according to the Catholic Church, doing a good work is one of the ways you can assist in the process of gaining yourself a place in heaven. And it does make sense that even a monetary donation to doing good Christian work would be itself a kind of holy act. But it did come to be seen as a money exchange for getting to heaven. And the one example that really got under Martin Luther's craw, so to speak, was a man named Tetzel, who was selling indulgences not far from Wittenberg, where Luther was professor of theology. Tetzel said, as soon as the coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. So you can see right there, money is going in and a soul is going up to heaven. It sounds so crass and you're absolutely right. Martin Luther, who was a monk and was a very devout professor of theology, was really rubbed the wrong way by people saying that they had bought these indulgences and therefore they were freed of their sins. And as a monk, Luther felt oppressed by the sinfulness of human nature, of his own nature. And so the idea that you could pay money to erase those sins and get quicker entry to heaven was really an issue for him. He took these issues very seriously and really struggled with them. And then he did what any good doctor of theology would do. He wrote out a series of arguments. But in his case, he posted them, at least according to tradition, to the doors of the castle church in Wittenberg. 95 theses, 95 arguments that took issue primarily with the selling of indulgences. Luther sent them to the local archbishop and they made their way to Rome. And so we have the beginnings of the Protestant Reformation. In fact, if you think about those words, Protestant Reformation, for just a moment, I think it's interesting to note that the word Protestant is formed out of the word protest and Reformation out of the word reform. So this was a kind of protest against the church and it was an attempt to reform it. So in the first video, we established that Martin Luther, this professor of theology in Wittenberg, this Augustinian monk, had posted his 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg. At least this is how the tradition tells the story that took issue with the way in which the Catholic Church thought about salvation and specifically took issue with the selling of indulgences. Luther was arguing against the sale of indulgences and that kind of monetary transaction for getting into heaven. Tetzel, who was selling indulgences, we quoted in the first video, but here's another quote. Won't you part with even a farthing to buy this letter? It won't bring you money, but rather a divine and immortal soul, whole and secure, in the kingdom of heaven. We have to understand that this exists within this larger scheme and the church thought that the ultimate aim was a good one, but he sounds like a used car salesman. So Luther in one section of the 95 Theses says, you know, people are gonna ask questions that we can't really answer about what we're doing with these indulgences, such as, why does not the Pope empty purgatory for the sake of holy love and the dire need of the souls that are there if he redeems an infinite number of souls for the sake of miserable money with which to buy a church? The former reason would be most just, the latter is most trivial. So what he's saying is, if the Pope has the authority, the treasury of merit of all of the saints that he can distribute, why is he selling them to build the church? Why doesn't he just redeem the souls that are in purgatory and send them up to heaven if he has the power to do that. And there was a perception that the church 
at times was a rather corrupt institution that seemed to be more concerned with power and political issues and worldly issues and not so concerned with the salvation of souls. Well, the previous pope, Julius II, certainly had that kind of reputation. Right. This is a hard thing for us to realize, I think, but this time the popes claimed not only spiritual power like they do today, but also political power and governed these very significant lands known as the papal states. And so in some ways, the pope functioned as the princes of territories in Italy. Right. Pope Julius II led armies into battles against other Christians to reclaim territories that were historically part of the papal states. So this notion of a kind of corruption in Rome is infusing this entire discussion, this entire argument. So there had been other reformers before Luther who were not successful. For example, we could look to John Wycliffe in the 14th century. So in the 1300s, this Englishman had set about to translate the Bible into the vernacular, into the common language, into English. He organized the translation of the Bible into English. He translated much of it himself. Especially much of the New Testament. It was important to him that the Bible be available to people in their common language, that people could read it. If it's in Latin, essentially only the priests could read it. This is important for us because this idea of enabling the reading of the Bible was critical for Luther, and we'll get to that. Okay, so let's just step back for a moment and just remember that in Western Europe at this time, the vast majority of the population was illiterate. But those that could read would be reading in the vernacular, not Latin. And by vernacular, I mean their common language. Languages, whether it was English or German or French or Italian, it wasn't Latin. And this was a means that the church could control the word of God. Well, it meant that you heard the word of God through the priest. You weren't able to read it yourself. Wycliffe also attacked the abuses of the church, the worldliness of the church. But after he died, he was declared a heretic. His body was exhumed, it was burned, his books were burned, he was punished after the fact. <laughs> Another early reformer was John Huss. Now, he was from Bohemia, and he was ultimately burned at the stake. In 1415, so this is just a little bit more than 100 years before Luther. Now, those 95 theses were posted in Latin, but people translated it without his authorization into German and then used the new technology of the printing press and distributed it widely. The printing press had been invented in the mid-15th century, incredibly important invention for the spread of Protestant ideas. Well, think about what's happening here. Instead of the distribution network of the church, you have people acting on their own outside of that structure in their own language. So Luther posts the 95 Theses in 1517. Word gets to the Pope. He's accused of heresy, but he's gaining support widely. And in 1521, he's called to a large council. So this event we call the Diet of Worms, and it was under the auspices of the Holy Roman Emperor. So this is an unfortunate name. <laughs> yes, it the is. Diet of Worms. Nobody's eating worms. <laughs> but a, a diet is a gathering, a council, and Worms or Worms is a city in Germany. So the new Holy Roman Emperor, who's by the way only a teenager at this time, has summoned Luther. He's given him an authorization of safe passage. That is, he won't be arrested on his way, and he is to testify at this council. So Luther is asked if he authored the books he's presented with, his own books. Luther says, yes, I did. And then he's asked, do you stand by the ideas in these books? And Luther says, give me a day to think about that. And that request is granted. He comes back the next day and by all accounts gives an eloquent defense of the ideas in the books and does not renounce any of the ideas. It's pretty clear that the lines are drawn and Luther leaves Worms. He's declared an unrepentant heretic. It's clear he's going to be arrested. Possession of his writings is forbidden and he leaves the city of Worms. Remember, he's been granted safe passage, so he's allowed to leave Worms. Now here's the crucial moment. Will he end up like Huss that is burned at the stake, arrested? Will that be the end of his efforts or will something else happen? Well, something else does happen and that's because of political issues. The new 
emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, had gotten that job because of the vote of men in Germany, princes, who are called electors. And one of those electors, the elector of Saxony, secretly kidnaps Luther as he leaves the city of Worms and hides him away in a castle where, by the way, Luther immediately gets down to work writing and translating the New Testament. And by the time Luther emerges and returns to public life, the Holy Roman Emperor is involved in other issues and doesn't pursue his arrest. So Luther is able to do something that, Huss, that Wycliffe was not able to do, which is to continue his campaign. In a way, the whole Reformation happens because of issues like this, that local rulers, whether they're monarchs or princes, are tired of ceding so much authority and political power to the Pope and use the opportunity of the Reformation to rest back some control of their own lands, of their own people. If you think about the power structure in Europe at this time, especially in what will become Germany, you have the local princes, you have the authority of the Pope in Rome on the other side of the Alps, but you also have the Holy Roman Emperor, so it was very complicated, and everybody was trying to enlarge their own stake. So Martin Luther is at the Diet of Worms. He's been confronted with his own writings. He's in a really dangerous situation. Luther was going against one of the central doctrines of the church, and that was that you were justified, that is, that you got to heaven in two ways, according to the church. One, through God's forgiveness, through God's grace. The other, through things that you could do yourself, choices that you could make as a human being, through what the church called good works. So by good works, we mean, for instance, helping to build St. Peter's Basilica. Exactly, or donating money to the church. Or helping the poor, or any of the things that, that we think in the modern world of charitable work. Exactly. And Luther was deeply disturbed by this idea because in his own conscience, he felt so sinful that nothing he felt that he could do could help him get to heaven. There was not enough good works to do in the world to remove the sin that he felt that he lived with and that all human beings lived with. If you think about the medieval mind tallying up the sins they've committed, and sometimes sins can just be like jealousy or envy, and tallying those against the good works that they've done. You can imagine this constant tallying that must have gone on in the medieval conscience. And so this is a terrible responsibility on the individual. And so it must have been a tremendous relief when he read carefully the words of St. Paul. Luther read St. Paul, who said, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. Those last words were critical for Luther. That meant to Luther that one is justified, one gets to heaven through faith alone, not through good works. Salvation was something freely granted by God and not something that had to be earned by human beings. So faith was a kind of gift that God gave you, and that faith was all you needed to get to heaven through faith alone is one of Luther's central ideas. So all of this makes sense in relationship to the 95 Theses and to Luther's concern about indulgences, because the indulgence is this proposition that good works will hurry the soul to heaven, and that's precisely what Luther is taking the issue with. And with really the whole authority of the church to forgive, to remit sin, and to allow a person into heaven. Luther's feeling was that the only power to do that was with God. So he looks at his books and he does not renounce them. No. And he eventually returns to Wittenberg and founds the Lutheran church and sparks many other types of Protestantism that we'll talk about in the next video. So to recap from the last video, Luther refused to renounce his teachings at the Diet of Worms and was kidnapped as he left the Diet of Worms by the Elector of Saxony and secreted away in a castle where he translated the New Testament into German. 
This is an enormous undertaking, which he completes in a matter of months. And it's important to Luther because it means that everyone can read the Bible for themselves. Luther's main ideas are scripture alone and the priesthood of all believers. So you don't need to go to the church to understand the word of God, to understand the path to salvation. All you need to do is to read the Bible, scripture alone. So putting the Bible in the hands of everyone. This other idea of the priesthood of all believers is this notion that we can have a direct relationship with God that's unmediated by the priest, by a local bishop, or by the pope. It's just us and our creator. So we've come across three major ideas then from Luther. Faith alone, scripture alone, and the priesthood of all believers. Now, these ideas that we can look directly at the scriptures, that we can have that kind of direct relationship with God, means that lots of people can come up with slightly varying understandings of what that relationship is. Right. As soon as the word of God is not mediated by the church, as soon as everyone can read it for themselves, it becomes clear just how ambiguous much of what's in the New Testament and the Old Testament really is, and, and how differently it can be interpreted by different people. And that's why we have so many different Protestant sects. Immediately, Luther's words spread very quickly. If we go to Zurich, to Switzerland, we find Zwingli. Like Luther, he looks to scripture as the sole authority, not the church, but scripture. Now, he differed from Luther in one important regard, the Eucharist. Now, Luther had already broken with the Catholic Church's understanding of the Eucharist, that there was transubstantiation, that is, that the bread and the wine was by miracle, transformed into the actual flesh and the actual blood of Christ. Luther believed that the blood of Christ and the flesh of Christ was present in the bread and the wine, but not that the priest had this kind of special power that allowed for the transformation itself. And then Zwingli changes that interpretation and says that the Eucharist is entirely symbolic and that there is no actual blood and no actual flesh present in the church. Right, and actually Luther and Zwingli got together to debate this issue to try to create a more unified Protestant church, but they were unable to agree. So you can see these very serious doctrinal disputes that are going on during this time. Everything is being questioned. Well, in Zurich, at the same time, also we have another group, the Anabaptists, and they're fascinating because they take issue with the practice of baptism close to birth. That is, an infant is brought and baptized. They look back to the belief that Christ was baptized as an adult. That is, he was baptized of his own free will, and they were called the Anabaptists by people who didn't like them because they saw this kind of spiritual awakening later in life when we could take responsibility for our spiritual lives. Right, and Anabaptist actually means rebaptism, which was completely against Catholic Church doctrine. And the Amish and the Mennonites actually come directly from the Anabaptists. And those may be more familiar to us. John Calvin, another really important reformer during this period, who we might know for his doctrine of predestination. This is really following very much what Luther also taught, that all you needed to have was faith. God had already decided for Calvin from the beginning of time who was elect. In other words, who was blessed, who would go to heaven, and who would go to hell. In other words, completely disregarding the possibility of free will, of choice. It's interesting because we generally think that we have some agency, that we can make our way into heaven if only we are really truly good. But Calvin and Luther are both saying, no, this is entirely God's will, and we only enact it. God exists in an eternal realm, and so it's not like God woke up on Monday and said, you're damned, and you over there, you're going to hell, but something that's predetermined. Now, Calvin was French. He was a lawyer originally, but he fled to Switzerland. But let's go to England. What's happening there? Well, Henry VIII wants an annulment from his, his first wife, Catherine of Aragon, because she's failed to produce any male heirs to the throne. Well, she had produced, or I should say they had produced male heirs. They just hadn't survived infancy. And so Henry VIII applies to the Pope for an annulment, and the Pope is actually worried about offending the Holy Roman Emperor, and there's all sorts of political issues, but says, sorry, I can't grant you an annulment. So Henry then goes to the head of the church in England and says, will you grant me an annulment? And that is granted. 
And so the power of the Pope is usurped in this case. And soon after that, an act of parliament makes the king, the monarch of England, the head of the church in England. But I think we need to be careful because we don't want to say that the Anglican church, that is the church of England that Henry is now heading, is entirely the result of his desire for a divorce or an annulment. There are strong spiritual and also political issues here. Just like in the Germanic countries, many felt that the Pope had too much power. And Henry was not only getting his annulment, he was also getting the lands of the church. Protestantism is spreading in primarily German-speaking countries, up in Scandinavia, and England and Scotland, in Switzerland. But if we look to southern Germany and Italy, or France, or Spain, those countries remain predominantly Catholic. All true, but focusing too much on the politics and focusing too much on Henry's marriages, because you know ultimately Henry VIII will have six marriages, is to miss the brutality, the violence of this period. On both sides, Catholics and Protestants, thousands of people were hanged, burned at the stake, tortured simply because of their beliefs. And each side was convinced that they were in the right and the other side was not only in the wrong, but actually somehow in the power of the devil. This was one of the most violent periods in Europe and some of the worst violence took place in France. Now the French Protestants were known as Huguenots and initially there was some tolerance, but that ended fairly quickly and the Huguenots were declared in mass heretical. That is, Protestantism was outlawed in France. And there was a civil war in France for much of the end of the 16th century. But just like in the German countries and just like in England, the issues were not only spiritual, they were also political. And so what you had is an alignment of the ruling families of France pitted against each other on both the Protestant and the Catholic sides. We also see attempts at tolerance. So, for example, in the German states, the Peace of August Augsburg in 1555 establishes this principle of whose realm, his religion. This idea that the local princes in the Holy Roman Empire could choose the religion for their area. In other words, they could choose between Protestantism and Catholicism. It's not going to be declared by the Holy Roman Emperor. The ruler of each region is going to get to decide. And similarly, in France, we have the Edict of Nantes in 1598, which establishes a principle of religious toleration. So that really ends this long period in the second half of the 16th century, known as the French Wars of Religion. And finally, there is some peace. But ultimately, things just got worse. By the early 17th century, we see the beginning of the Thirty Years' War, which pitted Protestants and Catholics against each other, especially in the Holy Roman Empire. In the previous three videos, we looked briefly at what it was like to be a Christian before the Reformation, before 1517. Then we looked at Martin Luther, we looked at his ideas and the spread of his ideas, as well as the violence that resulted. And for our final video, we want to look at the response by the Catholic Church. And so, whereas we call what Luther and his followers did the Protestant Reformation, the Church's response is referred to as the counter Reformation, the word counter here meaning against. Well, the church had lost a lot. The church had lost lands. It had lost faithful. That's right. It lost souls. And in the last video, we ended talking about violence. But the violence wasn't always against people. Sometimes it was also against things. And churches, that is the architecture of the Roman Catholics, which existed throughout Western Europe, was an important focus of the violence of the Protestants against the Catholic Church. The practice of Catholicism was incredibly visual. And there was a real concern among the Protestants, not so much by Luther, but mostly by his followers, that images were being abused, that they were being prayed to as if the images had power themselves instead of just a way of reaching the divine, of passing through the images to the divine. That's right. Calvin specifically had a problem with this and believed that the images in churches were actually creating a kind of idolatry. This goes back to the second commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in the heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. So this notion that to create is in a sense usurping a little bit of God's responsibility. That is God creates when an 
artist creates, it is a kind of falsehood. It is creating an idol. So Protestants began waves of iconoclasm, that is the destruction of images. Let's take apart that word for a moment, iconoclasm. It's a compound that's made of two words, icon, which is Greek for image, and clasm, which means violence. So it is literally violence against images. And there were iconoclastic riots within five years or so after Luther's 95 Theses. This is one of the great tragedies in the history of art, actually, where an untold number of paintings, of sculptures, were destroyed. And this happened especially in Northern Europe, in the Netherlands. So in essence, what the Protestants often did is they took over a Catholic church and they stripped it of all of those sensual forms, all that sculpture, those tapestries, and left it a kind of pristine space. So we know that Luther is going against church teaching in all these different ways. Faith is the path to salvation, not good works. Scripture is the way to understand God, not listening to the teachings of the church. Now, the Catholic Church didn't take all of this lying down, right? We know that there were efforts to make Luther bend to their will, right? At the Diet of Worms, for example, Luther is excommunicated after that. And by excommunicated, we mean basically is no longer a member of the church. In 1545, the church holds something called the Council of Trent, essentially a kind of meeting of all of the highest levels of the church in Europe. At first, the idea was really to reconcile with the Protestants. Protestants were invited. They didn't show up, however, and in the end, reconciliation was clearly impossible. One of the most important outcomes of the Council of Trent was that the Catholic Church reaffirmed its doctrines. That is, it doubled down. It said the very things that Luther had taken issue with were reaffirmed. So regarding the issue of whether good works have a role in salvation, the church said, indeed, they do. Regarding purgatory and the efficacy of indulgences, do indulgences do anything? Does purgatory exist? The church affirmed all of that. The church affirmed transubstantiation, the changing of the bread and wine during the Eucharist to the body and blood of Christ. And by doing so, it affirmed the power and importance of the priesthood and of the hierarchy of the church. And lastly, the church affirmed that scripture alone wasn't enough, that one really also needed the teachings, the traditions of the church. So they gave very little ground. All they did was agree that in some areas there was room for reform. They did try to stamp out the kind of corruption that had in part led to the Reformation. But let's get back to the images for a moment, because that was also important in the Council of Trent. The Council said this, Images of Christ, of the Virgin Mother of God, and of the other saints are to be placed and retained, especially in the churches, and due honor and veneration is to be given to them. So they're reaffirming immediately. Images belong in the church. But what's important is why. They say, quote, because the honor which is shown them is referred to the prototypes which they represent. So if somebody is honoring a statue of the Virgin Mary, they are actually affirming the honor to the Virgin Mary herself. But the church said there was even more benefit. Yes. Let the bishops diligently teach that by means of the stories of the mysteries of our redemption portrayed in paintings and other representations, the people are instructed and confirmed in their articles of faith. So art was a way of actually didactically getting the ideas of the church across to lay people, many of whom were still illiterate. And deepening their faith, that's right. Also that great profit is derived from all holy images because through the saints, the miracles of God and salutary examples are set before the eyes of the faithful so that they may fashion their own life and conduct in imitation of the saints and be moved to adore and love God and cultivate piety. So the way in which art functions as an example that we can follow in our daily lives. So the church's response is threefold. One, 
They reaffirm all the basic doctrines of the church that had been attacked by the Protestants. They begin a major campaign to spread the teachings of the Catholic faith all around the world. Well, remember, this is the age of discovery. The new world has been discovered. There's increasing trade with Asia and with Africa. And so the Catholics are really evangelizing in all of these places. The last in this threefold response of the church is an effort to stamp out heresy. So the church establishes the Inquisition, the Roman Inquisition. The church also creates the index of forbidden books. And it's just at this time that Ignatius Loyola founds the Jesuit order. The Jesuits are all about faithfulness. They have an absolute faith in the Pope, and they are at the Pope's disposal. The Jesuits established schools, they spread the Christian faith throughout the world, and they fought Protestantism. There's a fabulous and very literal example of all of these ideas of the Counter-Reformation in a sculpture by an artist whose name is Le Gros in the mother church of the Jesuits in Rome. The title of this sculpture is Religion Overthrowing Heresy and Hatred. Okay, now first of all, it's important to know that the sculpture is just to the right and below a very large altar to St. Ignatius Loyola. At the top left, we see the figure of religion wielding a thunderbolt and a cross. Now, by religion, Le Gros means Roman Catholicism. And religion is looking down at and about to attack two figures. One is an older female figure who represents hatred, and the other figure falling towards us, wrestling with snakes is the allegorical figure that represents heresy. He's falling over a series of books, and one of those books has on its spine Luther's name. So heresy here couldn't be any more explicit. Heresy is Luther. It is Protestantism. And as if that isn't making the point sharply enough, on the left, we see a little angelic figure who's ripping pages out of the book by Luther's followers, Zwingli. It's important to remember that each side saw the other as the devil. Luther called the Pope the Antichrist. The Pope called Luther the Antichrist. It was a time of black and white. There was no middle ground. And these divisions literally reshaped the countries of Europe. Even now, the countries in Southern Europe are predominantly Catholic. The countries in Northern Europe are predominantly Protestant. And even as late as the 20th century, there is violence that erupts between these factions. We saw that through most of the 20th century in Ireland, for example. It's also interesting to think about the ways that the Protestant Reformation set the stage for the modern world. This idea of not listening to a single authority, but listening to your own conscience. I think this is a key feature of the modern world. Mm -hmm.